Okay then. Um, hello, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the opening session in this uh, the third part of the Humanity Center's six semester exploration of natural landscapes and human meaning. As those of you who have attended these sessions before will know, uh, this initiative constitutes an attempt to consider dramatically uh, different landscapes from a wide variety of perspectives, spanning the, the gamut of academic disciplines from the arts and humanities to the sciences. Having explored the ocean and the desert last academic year, our attention shifts now to a very different type of landscape, the verdant splendor of the forest. And the Humanity Center's programming this semester is indeed suffused with the forest theme. It began with a memorable visit from Alexander Nemirov of Stanford, uh, this semester's NAP chair of the liberal arts, who spoke, among other things, uh, about his haunting book, The Forest. We have a, a special class on this subject offered to our students and uh, taught by Dr. Fred Robinson. Thanks, Fred. There's still places in If any students here want to take a, a really interesting class, I highly recommend, recommend this one. Uh, and the exhibitions in our gallery have this tremendous topic as their focus. Uh, Gregory Crudson's Forest Fables, uh, behind me. You should go and see. If you haven't seen this yet, you should, you should go and see it. It's, it'll be open during the reception at the end. And uh, later this semester, Ori Gersh a uh, time-based piece simply called The Forest, uh, filmed uh, in Ukraine. That, that starts next month. So it's, uh, it's rather lovely to address the theme of the forest in a university setting like this, since it may uh, remind us of uh, Vico's words in The New Science concerning what he calls the order of human institutions. First, the forest, it's great, like first, the forests. We should have started the other uh, landscape series with the forest. First, the forests, after that, the huts, then the villages, and finally, the academies. We'll get into this. Now, before I start, there were a few uh, further words of thanks that are in order. The exhibitions uh, this semester have been beautifully put together by Sarah Bain, Susie Smith, and uh, Derek Cartwright. I can see here, thank you. Uh, for their advice, support, and organizational skill, thanks uh, due to, to Ron Kaufman, to Noel Norton, uh, Lindy Veer, and uh, the newest member of our team, uh, Maggie McRae. There are 23 speakers who will be contributing to this series, and I am grateful to each of them for the time and thought that they will dedicate to our reflections. And of those 23, I also want to express a special gratitude to today's principal speaker, Dr. Michael Mayer, who is joining me up here for this opening session. I'll, I'll say more about you uh, when, the, when the moment arrives. <laughs> So when we move from the ocean and the desert to the forest, we confront a markedly different type of landscape, one that seems on the face of it more relaxing, less dangerous, more welcoming. You see, in our, in our treatment of the ocean and the desert last year, we always had good reason to return to the concept of the natural sublime. We always thought about that concept when reflecting on their features the vastness, uh, the astonishing power, the danger, uh, the obscurity. Now, the forest, conversely, seems friendlier to human needs. Here we are. This is a relaxing image for the end of the day. Uh, the fear of being adrift in the ocean or lost in the parched and blistering heat of the desert these feelings contrast notably with the prospect of a tranquil stay among the mild colors and shaded ground of a quiet and tree rich forest. And indeed, the forest is not just an aesthetic delight for us. Uh, well known research now clearly shows 
the great health benefits of spending time in green spaces. For example, uh, a Japanese study from about 12 years ago showed that walking in forest environments decreases concentrations of cortisol, lowers blood pressure, and lessens stress levels. So the effect on both physical and mental health is beneficial. And recognition of such benefits, unsurprisingly, has led to calls for public policy initiatives, such as improving access to nature, factoring in the need for green spaces in urban design, and doing more to protect the natural environment, which obviously includes the protection of forest spaces. And we encounter here, of course, that tragic and self-destructive irony of our modern world, our need for forest spaces, and simultaneously our widespread destruction of those very spaces. And it's this kind of tension or relation that Robert Pogue Harrison uh, describes memorably in his important book, Forests, uh, The Shadow of Civilization. I'll talk more about this book um, a, a little later. Uh, Harrison writes, humanity begins to appear in a new light as a species caught in the delicate and diverse web of a forest-like planetary environment. More precisely, we are beginning to appear to ourselves as a species of parasite, which threatens to destroy the hosting organism as a whole. A powerful passage. Now, an entire session of this series will be dedicated to the very topic of deforestation. So, I simply want to note here, and Michel Bougier, who's here at the moment, will be will be speaking on on that. Um, I simply want here to note an element of the human response to the loss of trees and the diminution of forest landscapes. The Australian philosopher uh, Glenn Albrecht uh, has coined the term solastalgia to describe the lived experience of the desolation of a much loved landscape. This encompasses the sense of distress caused by environmental change or more specifically to a changed place which while still counting as our home, no longer comforts us in the way it formerly did. In short, Albrecht has written, solastalgia is a form of homesickness one gets when one is still at home. You know, sadly, it will not be difficult for you to find examples of this from your own lives. Um, an example from my own, very recently, uh, I visited the house where I was born. People were always amazed I was born in a house. I was on like a character from a Thomas Hardy novel. Um, I went back there just to see the house where I was born. And this is the house I lived in for the first 10 years of my life. And I remember very well, there was a, a, a pocket of woodland that nestled up against our garden when I was small. It, was, it felt, it's probably tiny, but it felt like a huge expanse of forest. And I used to go and uh, play amongst the trees with my little friends. And our imaginations would be sparked by the trees and the shadows. And of course, the fairies that we were all sure dwelled among the, among the tree trunks. So I went back there uh, this summer and I found that it had been replaced by a grove of uniform houses. Horrible, horrible, bad, badly designed houses. And it really felt like a part of my life had been amputated. You all, you all can think of examples of this. A more beautifully crafted expression of this feeling can be found in the poetry of John Clare, great labouring uh, English poet. He was a uh, notoriously rooted and uh, insanity-doomed uh, poet whose, whose mental constitution could not tolerate relocation from where he, I mean, he, he lived in a home and he had to move uh, and he moved just three miles down the road and he couldn't tolerate the change of, of location. And that says something about the kind of rootedness of, of Claire. Uh, in his poem, uh, To a Fallen Elm, uh, this is composed in 1821, the felling of a beloved tree provokes warm memories of his childhood and horror at the knave's hand, as he calls it, that could bring this gorgeous life down and replace it with a workhouse prison. Uh, here are the lines, he says, 
old favorite tree thou seen times changes lower, but change till now did never come to thee. For time beheld thee as his sacred dower, and nature claimed thee her domestic tree. Storms came and shook thee with a living power, yet steadfast to thy home thy roots hath been. It's a beautiful, it's never, never any punctuation in Claire's poems. It's just a stream of words. This entire air of sadness and loss hangs over Claire's poem. But in it, we can begin also to detect a set of ambiguities in our human relation to woodlands and forests, competing impulses, competing feelings. And I want to explore this a little further by noting a couple of passages in uh, Robert McFarlane's great book, The Wild Places. It's Robert McFarlane, a superb nature writer. Uh, the wood, McFarlane explains in The Wild Places, is deeply and etymologically connected with the wild. The association of the wild and the wood runs deep in etymology. The two words are thought to have grown out of the root word vald and the old Teutonic word valtus, meaning forest. Valtus entered Old English in its variant forms of wield, wold, and wold which were used to designate both a wild place and a wooded place in which wild creatures, wolves, foxes, bears, survived. The wild and the wood also graft together in the Latin word silva, which means forest and which emerged, and from which emerged the idea of savage with all its connotations of ferality. Now, and. An ambivalent attitude can be seen to emerge from this association, our civilized condition existing uneasily next to the uncivilized wildness of the forest and producing a largely unarticulated tension in us. Here's McFarlane again. Uh, this is the cover of The Wild Places. And this time he's, he's reflecting on Robert Pogue Harrison's aforementioned book. He says, to understand the wild, you must first understand the wood. It's a great line. For civilization, as the historian Robert Pope Harrison writes, literally cleared its space in the midst of forests. For millennia, a sylvan fringe of darkness defined the limits of its cultivation, the margins of its cities, the boundaries of its domain but also the extravagance of its imagination. Now, this book that he's referring to, Harrison's Forest, is a fascinating exploration of the ambiguities found in our thinking about and attitude toward the forest. So if we think of our world as formerly a vast primeval forest and of our species as emerging long, long ago, from the forest and establishing cities in opposition to those dark woods, then a range of fascinating tensions appears. For one thing, the forest may appear to us as some kind of original Eden from which we have tragically departed. And perhaps when we find ourselves in the forest, we feel more at ease and at home without all this stuff. Or conversely, it may appear as a humbling reminder of our very lowly origins and also of the dangers of which civilization has protected us. Maybe in some kind of tension, it, it presents to us both of those things. These tensions, of course, animate the old and familiar wilderness versus civilization contrast, which is very familiar to us from the cases of Rousseau on the left and, and Thoreau uh, in the middle there. In, in writers like this, Rousseau and Thoreau, the natural condition is vastly preferable to the cheaply wrapped civilization we find ourselves in, and we should, as much as possible, uh, immerse ourselves in nature, or, uh, you know, as Thoreau urges us in Walden, go back to the woods, you go to the woods. Uh, this is a, a Sigmund Freud quote. <laughs> um, he, has a, he sees this as a sort of dewy-eyed romanticism on their part, a uh, fantasy. Uh, the woods and the wilderness may seem appealing to us since the wildlife is free from the, re from the repressions imposed by civilization and which make us neurotic for things. But we should not forget how much civilization protects us 
and indeed protects us precisely from those relentless natural forces that might appear so charming. Now, one of the most interesting comparisons then between the woods and the city, between the woods and civilization, is examined by Harrison when he discusses what he calls uh, the forest phobia of rationalism. It's a great line. The forest phobia of rationalism. And this excellent formulation is arrived at during a, a discussion of Jean-Paul Sartre's philosophical novel, uh, Nausea, uh, Requentin, the, the novel's narrator, at one point says this. This is this interesting cover of the Penguin edition of it, where you can see the, the, the city, and then you have this puddle with the tree reflected in it. So again, he've got, there's a lot of discussion in Sartre in the book between the city and the, and the woods. And the, the most dramatic one probably is this. He says, I am afraid of cities, but you mustn't leave them. If you go too far, you come up against the vegetation belt. Vegetation has crawled for miles towards the cities. It is waiting. Once the city is dead, the vegetation will cover it, will climb over the stones, grip them, search them, make them burst with its long black pincers. It will blind the holes and let its green paws hang over everything. You must stay in the cities as long as they are alive. You must never penetrate alone this great mass of hair. Brilliant, that's brilliant. Like this great mass of hair <laughs> waiting at the gates. As an aside there, and quite an important one, um, we can note a connection between this and the lesson drawn by Little Red Riding Hood uh, after her horrifying encounter with the wolf. Now in the version of this tale told by the Brothers Grimm, as you'll all know well, Little Red Riding Hood has gotten waylaid in the forest, enchanted by the flowers and the bird song. She says, um, it's such fun. It's such fun out here in the woods, she says, as she strays from the path, allowing the wolf to devour the young girl's grandmother and to disguise himself as the poor old woman. Now, once the story is finally resolved, the wolf slaughtered, and the girl and her grandmother saved when they tear open the wolf and the grandmother comes tumbling out perfectly well. Little Red Riding Hood resolves on a future course of action. As long as I live, I'll never leave the path and run into the forest by myself. I never, never leave the path. There's a great bit in Apocalypse Now um, where the, the late, great Frederick Forrest, uh, who died this year, a uh, chef, uh, he gets out the boat and, and encounters a tiger and he comes back to the boat and says, never get out of the boat, never get out of the boat. And it's a, that's the, the kind of little Red Riding Hood theme transposed to, to, to Vietnam, among other things. Uh, the contrast between the rational city and the non-rational forest might well be centered upon the idea of the straight line. A city, and certainly a city like San Diego with its grid system, uh, a Street, B Street, C Street, 6th Avenue, 7th Avenue. It's very hard to get lost when you have this. This is designed, of course, with human navigation in mind. It's made to, feel us, to make us feel at home. It's navigable. No such plan exists in the forest, of course, which is why it may be such a nightmare to the rationalist who wants things to make sense, to be ordered. Harrison discusses a pertinent passage in René Descartes' Discourse on Method, a work in which uh, the great French rationalist is seeking a reliable method for discerning truth. In the absence of that method, Descartes resolves to remain resolute in his actions, and he uses the image of the forest here. It's Descartes. He says, in this, I would imitate travelers who finding themselves lost in a forest ought not to wander this way and that, or what is worse, remain in one place, but ought always to walk as straight a line as they can in one direction and not change course for feeble reasons. Even if at the outset, it was perhaps only chance that made them choose it. For by this means, if they're not going where they wish, they will finally arrive at least somewhere where they probably will be better off than in the middle of a forest. There's so much to talk about in this passage. 
but a couple of things only. For one thing, it displays the forest phobia pretty well. Like you'll be better off anywhere than in a forest. This is the worst place that you could find yourself. And the recommendation then to follow a straight line when lost in a forest is notable too. For that course of action is notoriously difficult to follow. I spent a bit of time up in Idlewild this summer trying to get some sort of peace. Uh, and I wasn't lost in a forest, but I realized I had no idea where I was. And going by the straight line was not taking me where I thought I was going. So the forest is a disorienting place. And the attempt to cut a straight path through it can often lead the wanderer right back to the place where they formerly were. It's telling that uh, Freud lists as a paradigm example of the uncanny, the case of getting lost in a forest and constantly finding yourself back at the place you started. And maybe the most unnerving element of all in the now classic horror movie, The Blair Witch Project, which I'm sure you'll all remember, is not the sound of the spectral witch herself, but the very fact of this, getting lost in the forest, not being able to find a route out, always returning to the same spot as night falls, the confusion and the despair. Now, that the forest should feature in many stories of the supernatural is important, and in great examples of the genre, we see the peculiar aspects shift that is consistent with the ambiguities we've been here noting. So, in such stories, the forest will appear first as something beguiling and attractive, but when entered, it reveals a darker and less amenable side. We see this, for example, in Algernon Blackwood's story, Ancient Lights, very good story, I think, in which a, a land surveyor spying a short cut through a charming wood finds himself tormented by rustling leaves, which scratch him, move, block his path, and prevent him from leaving. Now, the aspect shift I'm talking about occurs probably most dramatically, or very dramatically at least, in M.R. James's story, A Neighbor's Landmark. M.R. James is one of the, a great, great ghost story writer. Now, in this story, the narrator begins an inquiry into a landowner's reduction of a piece of woodland, a piece of woodland called Betton Wood. And he starts his inquiry having found a disturbing reference in an old book in a library, a reference to something that walks in the wood, a thing that knows not why it walks or why it cries. And he's got this idea, what is this thing that doesn't know why it walks or cries? So he takes a walk out and surveys the landscape and taking a view of this sylvan landscape, the, the narrator enters into a bucolic rapture about the delights of a wooded view illuminated by the sun's dying rays. And it's all very peaceful. But suddenly he is shocked from this meditation by a piercing shriek in his ear. And when he recovers his composure and turns back to the comforting landscape, its entire aspect has changed. He says this, when I turned to it again, the taste was gone out of it. The sun was down behind the hill and the light was off the fields. And when the clock bell in the church tower struck seven, I thought no longer of kind, mellow evening hours of rest and sense of flowers and woods on evening air. But instead, images came to me of dusty beams and creeping spiders and savage owls up in the tower and forgotten graves and their ugly contents below and of flying time and all it had taken out of my life. I won't say more about how that tale proceeds. It really needs to be read. I would recommend reading it. It's terrifying. But in James's story, we find that set of forest ambiguities already noted. The woods as attractive and as horrifying. Civilization's war against the fear-inducing forest, et cetera, et cetera. This reference here to flying time and all it had taken out of my life leads us to one last set of thoughts, namely to how the forest and its seasonal changes may prompt reflection on the stages, cycles, and vicissitudes of our own human lives. I suppose one of the most marked differences between the forest and our previously considered landscape, the desert, lies precisely in those seasonal changes. The desert, seemingly at least, 
confronts us with a vision of immutability. The landscape doesn't change, it's rock solid. Our minds are turned to very different thoughts by the dramatic changes in the life of the forest throughout the year. The vigorous new life of the spring, the full burgeoning greenery of the trees in the heat and shade of the summer months, the kaleidoscope of color brought on by autumn, the hint of decay hidden within that beauty. And finally, the, the wintry and naked trees seemingly dead and at times covered with frost. It would, I suppose, be a rather imaginative or unimaginative person who did not, at least at times, see in these changes a mirror of their life's own inevitable stages. The process of, of aging is the obvious example here that is reflected back to you when you think about seasonal changes in the forest. Though I'm also reminded of an episode in uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace, I'm nearly, I've just nearly completed War and Peace. The best thing that's ever happened to me is reading that book. And there's a remarkable moment in which Prince Andre, on two separate occasions, contemplates an old oak tree. And on the first occasion, the gnarled oak stands bare among some beaming leaf clad birches, seemingly reluctant to submit to the charms of springtime, mocking. Andre thinks it's sham of sunshine and happiness. Andre recognizes a soulmate in the scowling tree, a mirror of his own disappointment and bitterness. Now, when the spark of love is subsequently lit in Andre's breast and he sees the oak on a separate occasion, this time festooned with succulent young leaves, Andre delights in the symbolism and he recognizes it as an image of himself. He says, no, life isn't over at 31. <laughs> this is this new life beginning from the old Null tree. Now the changes in the woods in the trees indicating so vividly the passing of time may even prompt us to action. And such a message I take it is uppermost in a poem by A.E. Hausman, with which I'll close my remarks. Uh, the poet Hausman, 20 years old when uh, writing this poem, recognizes in the blossoming cherry tree the need to make the most of his remaining years, which may, he thinks, be profitably spent among the wooded delights of nature. He's the older Hausman, of course, the loveliest of trees. The cherry now is hung with bloom along the bough and stands about the woodland ride, wearing white for Easter tide. Now, of my three score years and ten, twenty will not come again, and take from seventy springs a score, it only leaves me fifty more. And since to look at things in bloom, fifty springs a little room, about the woodlands I will go to see the cherry hung with snow. It's a very beautiful poem about how the woods can be a, a source of delight in, through the various years of one's life. And with that, though, it gives me enormous pleasure to turn things over to my very distinguished colleague, Michael Mayer. Dr. Mayer joined the USD faculty in 1994 and is professor of biology. He received his PhD in botany from Washington State University, and his research focuses on plant systematics. This focus on plant diversity involves deciphering the evolutionary relationships among plants and then using these patterns to infer the processes by which plants evolve, speciate, and produce new lineages. He has collaborated with researchers at San Diego State University and the San Diego Natural History Museum in Balboa Park. Please welcome Dr. Mike Mayer. Great. Well, hello, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm very honored to be invited. 
Thanks, Brian. And, um, uh, but of course, I would have been deeply offended if I hadn't been invited. <laughs> this is my my thing, anyway. I'm, I got a degree in botany um, at the bachelor's level, master's and PhD. So I love this topic, and um, I will try to do my best to um, um, do something you find interesting today. I'm, I'm, Brian didn't give me much, uh, you know, guidance as to what to talk about. So uh, um, he already stole all the poems I was going to use. So uh, I'll do something else. Um, so we talk about the forest. We talk about definitions because you know, as scientists, we you'd expect we'd have technical definitions for the forest, and um, and basically we don't. Um, what you think of as a forest, botanists think of as a forest. There's not a whole lot of leeway there. I mean, there are not really many options. Uh, so, well, then what is a forest? Maybe we should define that. And I bet you could do it too. All right. So what do you think of when you think of a forest? Trees. Thank you very much. Lots of trees. Okay, so great. We got trees that's dominating the landscape, right? We've got a lot of trees, so we have a certain concentration of trees. And we don't just have little trees, right? They're typically about uh, 15 feet tall or more. At least that's what silvicologists uh, uh, would, would like to say. And they've agreed on this at an international level to some extent. So we have a forest. Um, typically, because of their density, you develop a sort of canopy. So they're close enough to where they're interdigitating um, branches. Gives you a, a roof. Gives you a canopy. Um, wherever you go in the world, you can recognize a forest, right? The definition is the same. Okay, where do woods and woodlands fit in? Is it actually a synonym? Um, there is a tendency that it's not exactly a synonym, that woods or woodlands uh, suggests a more of a sparse covering by trees. So for example, here are some examples of woods or woodlands uh, from various places in the world and I don't think you'd walk around on, on Oak Woodland in California and say, I'm walking in the woods, right? It doesn't have that same feel. It doesn't have the canopy, doesn't have the concentration of trees. So um, there is, again, some people use these terms synonymously, uh, I think particularly in Europe. Um, woodlands are often associated with forests on the edges so having to do a lot with uh, climatic changes on the fringes of forested areas. We'll talk a little bit about that going on. Um, so let's talk about forests on a global scale. Um, forests cover about 30% of the Earth's habitable landscape. Unfortunately, that's declined from about 57% 10,000 years ago. And this is primarily due to uh, 10,000 years is the magic number for the origin of agriculture. And um, uh, we have converted forest land to cropland in, in that time. It's home to, in general, uh, or it, in, in total, home to 80% of terrestrial biodiversity, plants and animals, and uh, fungi and whatnot. Tropical regions harbor about 45% of the world's forests. So this band in this area, there, 54% of our forests are found in just five countries. That's kind of a fun fact. You guys can't see this stuff down here. I'm sorry about that. We've got Russia and Canada, United States, Brazil, um, and China even though there are countries that are virtually completely forested. 
Okay, origins. All right, so where did forests come from? Now, this is a dilemma for me because uh, how far back do I go? And um, I decided I'd go all the way back. First, we need a tree. Uh, but before, how do we get a tree? Well, I'm going to go even further back. So I'm try to do this quick. Plants made it out onto land as early as 470 million years ago. That's what MYA means, right? Green algae evolved a, a series of adaptations to get out onto land. This floppy, filmy stuff found in pools uh, and, uh, and, and ponds, um, fresh water, eventually evolved into something like moss. Moss and its relatives are the plants that actually got out and made a foothold on the mostly rocky soil of the time. Amazingly enough, they were on their own for about 50 million years, 50 million years of a mossy earth. Well, eventually, vascular tissue and wood, I'm not going to get too much into now, vascular tissue and wood allowed some lineage within moss-like plants to get rigid and be able to fight against gravity, support itself in this non-buoyant type of atmosphere. In this dry atmosphere, it allowed water to be pumped up through the plant body, getting up throughout the, the plant system. And so at that point then, you've got a whole new arms race among plants. Now with the, the nifty tools of, of vascular tissue and wood, we've got a way to grow taller and taller. Because frankly, if you don't grow tall enough, you're gonna be shaded out. And then you're not gonna grow and you've lost. So you have these phenomenal solar collectors here on these um, wonderful support systems. And uh, then basically you've got a forest. So we have our first forests um, early on at this point. Too. I think we could say that the Carboniferous is an early height of the development of forest. In the Paleozoic era, I'll show you a geologic time scale. Yay! <laughs> In just a moment. The Carboniferous, these are the great coal forests of the world. That uh, gift that just keeps on giving, because we just keep mining into the Carboniferous layer of the of the geological strata and get coal for our uses. So much of the Earth's surface was covered with a tropical-like forest at this time. Plants that grew up to about 45, 60 feet tall. Okay, all due to uh, vascular tissue and wood. Okay then, since their origin, and I know this is a little, a little bit fuzzy for you, you don't have to worry too much about it. Since their origin, Forests have had a constant pressure, presence on Earth. It is the original um, type of um, um, vegetation, if you don't call, count mosses. <laughs> um, species composition, though, has changed over time. And I want to quickly uh, uh, consider this. Here are three eras. You can't read it. Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic. Here is the origin of lineages. The width of the band is an indicator of how many species there are in that group. So you can see how species start to um, increase in diversity and numbers. So uh, we were just talking about the Carboniferous forests here. So they dominate the forest in the, in the Paleozoic, including ferns and their relatives, tree ferns, large horsetails, and other things that are now off mostly extinct, but still some lycopods, if you know anything about those. But then the Mesozoic, some transition into a conifer-dominated landscape. You see the rise of conifers in the late Paleozoic, cycads, ginkgo, conifers, growing in number, dominating forests at this time. And finally, um, the evolution of flowering plants in the Cretaceous period led to their domination of many forests 
um, throughout the Cenozoic to today. But notice that these other lineages are still around, okay? Still a lot of conifers left. In fact, they're dominant in certain kinds of forests that I'll talk about. And we still have ferns. And uh, although uh, this is kind of funny, there's only one species of ginkgo left. So I think this bar is a little misleading. Uh, but what do you, what do you get? Uh, okay, so moving on to now the types of forests. Plant ecologists love studying veg vegetation. That's their thing, right? Um, right and uh, of course, the more you study something, the more diversity and pattern that you see, you come up with categories and then subcategories, and it goes on and on and on and on. Here's my favorite one right here. Um, Subfrigid, subhumid, broadleaf, and needle leaf mixed forest. <laughs> Let's spend a half an hour talking about that one. Um, now, we're going to make this a lot simpler. We're going to boil this down into the three general forest types I think people will uh, recognize. We have the taiga, the, the great boreal forest dominated by conifers. We have the tropical forest, consists of tropical rainforest. Then there's other forests in there we're not going to worry about, I'll call it tropical forest, dominated now by flowering plants, and then the temperate forests of the world, and these are um, sometimes dominated by conifers, sometimes mixed, sometimes by flowering plants. Okay, so on a geographic scale, uh, here we have um, a simplified uh, vision of plant um, vegetation types, starting here at the equator. This light green represents the tropical forest interspersed by, by savanna and grassland. But notice that this tropical forest can extend up to more than 20 degrees north and south latitude. So it's a broad band, except not always. We, due to issues of, of um, climatology, um, ocean currents, prevailing storm patterns, we actually get some dry um, areas in the tropical zone. Okay, so here we have the Amazon, we have Congo, and we have uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia, all that over here. Um, then this medium green here represents temperate forest. And notice it is lying around 40 degrees north latitude here. Um, it also lies around 40 degrees south latitude, but there ain't a whole lot of land down there. But nevertheless, here we have uh, we have the temperate forests of North America interspersed again because of the lacking water and um, and the uh, and temperature issues. We've got uh, some grasslands, the Great Plains, and such. We have the forests of Europe and the forests of China and Asia here. Now on the southern side of things, we do have some forest, um, temperate-like forest along the Andes at elevation. Okay? And then we have some in southern Australia and New Zealand. The taiga, surrounding about 60 degrees north latitude, subarctic zone. It's really tough on plants up there, but they create a monotonous, amazing band of vegetation. It's the largest single type of vegetation in the world, 60 degrees north latitude. Of course, it wavers up and down, and that, again, because of local weather patterns and such. <laughs> there is no, <laughs> there is no southern forest. We would call, if this is the boreal forest, which means the forest of the north, right, the northern forest, this would be Australis. There is no land mass at this point. So it's all, the taiga is all about the northern boreal forest. Okay. So let's think a little bit more about these limitations and opportunities 
for plants in these different zones. Hopefully you can see this fairly well, um, but it's all about water and temperature. Why can't we have forest covering the entire planet? Well, because of issues regarding water and temperature, and that's related to latitude. So if we talk about the tropical zone here, we have the tropical forest here. We have increasing dryness along this axis here and increasing temperature going down this way. But tropical zone, on this side, we have maximum water and we have maximum heat. That's just great for plants. As long as you have plenty of water, heat is good. You grow the tallest trees, the densest vegetation. But as we know, increasing dryness, the dryness now takes toll on the plants. If there's a lot of heat and lowering of the um, the, the moisture, uh, you're not going to be able to support trees. They start getting sparser and you can even end up with a desert. Okay, let's go up a little north, a little less land mass up here. Uh, the temperate forest, this side of the axis, plenty of water to support trees here, uh, but we're in the temperate zone. So now we have to deal with a little bit of uh, less temperature. Plants are, are, are different at this level. They're adapted to seasonality, okay? And of course, uh, as we get drier, again, we, we exceed the limit of the plants at this latitude to grow tree-like, um, given the, uh, the temperature and uh, the uh, moisture supply. Okay, then lastly, the boreal forest here, we're at the edges of the tolerance of, of any kind of tree um, here at its, at its, at its um, highest latitude. But notice, this is kind of interesting, we're not limited by water at this point, even though I will show you in a few minutes, you only get about 10 to 30 inches of rain per year. But the temperature is so low that you have a lot less evaporation. And so there's a lot less water stress on these plants. It just, they just don't have a whole lot of time to grow in any given year because the temperature is so low. Of course, above this point, the temperature is so low for a prolonged for for period of time that you can't support trees. Oh, by the way, and of course, these trees are yet different. Conifers are the only trees that are able to, uh, you know, there's a couple others in there, but the conifers are the dominant uh, tree at this level. And then we they peter out into tundra north of that. So there you go. That's where they came from. That's why they are where they are. Let's talk a little bit about old growth. Old growth has a mystique about it. Um, synonyms for old growth consider uh, can uh, include like primary growth or virgin forest, primeval forest, first growth, or mature forests. Old growth characteristics develop after about 150 to 500 years. This is the time that it takes to develop not only the size of the tree, but the ecological complexity, the emerging qualities that come from old growth. The, the ecological complexity, the relationships between species, become more elaborate. There's more species, so there is more of a, a complex network. So it is a, a fascinating um, type of uh, vegetation stage, and it is worth every dollar we can to save it because this is something that is way greater than the sum of its parts, okay? And this is not just old forest that's static and, 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 and gloomy. There's a lot of opportunities for other plants in here due to tree falls or other kinds of periodic disturbance. It keeps the system dynamic. It keeps all the species moving from gap to gap to gap to gap in the forest, maintaining that species diversity. And of course, there's not much left. Okay, so 
I was going to talk about the three general forest types pretty quickly, and we've already been introduced to them somewhat. Uh, right, so tropical forest near the equator, yes. Um, it's the oldest forest type. It's sort of the descendant of original forests. Um, it harbors 50% of global biodiversity. What's the word jungle mean? Well, jungle is often used simul uh, synonymously with rainforest, except really it's just the condition of the tropical rainforest where a lot of light penetrates. So along the edges of a rainforest, you get a lot of light. Um, in gaps in the forest, you get a lot of vegetation. Along rivers where people are always taking pictures, it looks impenetrable from the side. And that's simply because so much light is getting in. Now, any old growth forest will have a lot less vegetation on the forest floor due to the canopy becoming almost closed. We're not getting much light down on the forest floor. Okay, yes, and it's dominated by flowering plants, a lot of rain spread out evenly. It's just a beautiful place for plants to grow, right? If you can, if you can compete. All right, we still have members of the earliest lineages there. Okay, so yes, where light penetrates, you get a lot more undergrowth, a lot more shrub layer. Where light doesn't penetrate, it's the hardest on plants. They have to deal with a lot less light. Um, they either don't grow or they uh, um, they grow slowly. All right. Species composition, just a quick word. These forests around the world may look superficially similar. I've said they have the same definition, but they have completely different species, right? They look superficially similar, but the, 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 the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of species of all organisms here are virtually different from, in, from South America to Congo. All right, temperate forest. Seasonalities is the rule here. Plants have to adapt with freezing temperatures and um, they have various uh, ways to do that. Uh, we have sort of uh, um, a lower amount of rain. Um, we have both flowering plants and conifers, as I said before. Deciduous versus evergreen. Deciduous means that leaves are lost for a certain point of period of time on an annual basis. So deciduous leaves are only intended to, to do their job for about a year and then are lost. Okay. Uh, evergreen leaves uh, are uh, those that, that can survive more than one year. They can overwinter. They often have more invested in them so that they have um, a way to survive the winter. Okay. Now, this is not actually synonym for conifers and flowering plants, right? I mean, does anyone know of a deciduous conifer? Just to see if you're still listening to the way. A deciduous conifer? Anyone know bald cypress? Anyone know larch? Come on. All right. So they they are so they're not uh, synonyms here. How about hardwood and broadleaf? Um, often used as synonyms for flowering plants as well. You'll hear hardly, hardly um, hardwood forest or broadleaf forests. That's usually meaning um, flowering plant forest. Okay. All right, very little remains. There's some diverse categories. I'll show you a few examples. Here's our temperate deciduous forest. So this is mostly angiosperms, mostly flowering plants. Look at all those dying leaves there. Let's go see the dying leaves. <laughs> every time. Notice there's a few conifers creeping in on the edges here. Okay, montane coniferous forest. So in the temperate zone, we have higher elevations, which select more for conifers. Now they are in this uh, zone as well. Temperate rainforest. Now, in some places of the world, you're in the temperate zone. You are getting a massive amount of rainfall due to um, the climatic uh, idiosyncrasies there. So we have the northwestern um, 
United States, the tip of California, Oregon, Washington, Vancouver, we get uh, rainforest there. Here's the whole rainforest from o Olympic National Park. There are some other temperate rainforests in Southern Australia. There's a little bit in Britain, something in, in Norway, a little in New Zealand as well. Anyway, just add more water, more growth. Okay, old growth. Redwoods are found um, in this area as well. Some of it is found in the um, in uh, the heightened rainfall that we get along the coast, and some of that uh, is also found in the uh, temperate rainforest as well. Plants that can grow over 2,000 years. This is the coast redwood. I'm not even going to get into the big tree of the Sequoia um, National Park stuff. So, All right, taiga. <laughs> Got to keep moving here. This is the youngest forest type. This is uh, really kind of intriguing. It's only 12,000 years old, the taiga of the world. And, um, and it's for a pretty good reason. Covers most area of forest type. It formed after glaciers retreated. I'll go here. The uh, glacial maximum 18,000 years ago. Um, as it receded, the conifers from the temperate zone just followed on up as far as they could and formed the taiga. We have the lowest in biodiversity. It really is a hard place for plants to live. Rainfall, again, is, is pretty low. Growing season sort, dominated by few conifer species for the most part. Poor thin soils. So after the glaciers receded, melted away, they left a shallow and sometimes um, marked with depressions, shallow soil, um, thin soil, often boggy, and we get this kind of um, landscape with stunted growth sometimes and with low diversity. Very hard place to live in the winter. And then at its northern edges, when it's getting closer to the pole, this is a, a great picture. This is, a, this is called Krumholtz um, conifer. This is basically a, a conifer that's beaten into a carpet, right, by the elements. And that's as far as they go. Okay, so forests and humans. Thought I'd, I'd 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 leave my comfort zone a little bit, talk a bit about this, um, and try to deal with about four million years of uh, evolution in one slide. Okay, <laughs> so as already been alluded to, forest is our home. Primates evolved in the forest. Our our ancestors evolved in the forest almost all of our primate relatives still live in forests. We ventured out, probably due to climate change, um, and actually some new opportunities. So as the forest receded, became more grass-like, or grassland, savanna, forced us into a new type of a circumstance. We evolved to meet those challenges, and eventually the forest became more of a place that we visited, where rather than where we live, and the development of agriculture over the past 10,000 years led to the gradual replacement of forest. There I did it. So, yeah. Okay, so yes, and here's what we have now. We have fragmented forests through many of the great um, former forests of the world, but it's all, you know, it's not uh, all doom and gloom. There is, um, there's reason for hope. We know the tide is turning. We know that uh, perspectives have shifted and that uh, the environmental movement which started in the late 19th century added so many voices, uh, whether they talked from a point of, uh, of um, conserving resources or the intrinsic value of old growth or as a home where people live, or as something that is transcendent beyond just a vegetation type. Um, we know that, um, that uh, these poets and authors and, and leaders are uh, 
are helping us um, make a change. Um, I should say very quickly, Ireland is an example. Ireland, before humans arrived about 9,000 years ago, was about 80% forest, right? By the time then um, uh, humans arrived um, and, and Romans really did a number, and then England did a number, by the time we got to 1600, we have about 20% left. And at the turn of the 19th century, there was about 1% left. But now Ireland is about 11% forested due to replanting and conservation. Okay, so a last few words about forests and me. What is my relationship with forests? Um, and whether you like it or not. Um, I grew up in LA. And I have to say that it's very likely that my career trajectory was dependent on forests, that that triggered where I ended up here. Um, I grew up in LA. Um, my first exposure to forests was probably the, the mountains, San Gabriel Mountains, San Bernardino Mountains, the, the uh, Angeles National Forest in that area. Every summer we would go to Yosemite as a family, go camping there in the valley, an amazing experience, it's just my favorite place on earth. And, um, you know, those campfires and the nature hikes and the rangers and all that stuff was just great for a kid. So then I got to go to Humboldt State University where I got my bachelor's and master's, a completely indulgent experience for a botanist. If you don't know where Humboldt State University is, shame on you. <laughs> but here we are, in the northern west tip of California in the redwood forest that's right there. And it looks like that. It is just bang up against the forest there uh, off of the off of Arcata Bay. This is where I stayed. There's my residence hall. It's still surviving. There it is. Where you could walk out and walk up in forest logging roads up into the forest and walk around. And it wasn't it wasn't a primary growth forest. Was an old growth, but it was a beautiful and older. So more about eighty years old at that time. Um, still some remnants some reminders of old growth in that forest. So, oh, so I'm, I'm, I'm at the end now. Um, forest, I just, you know, there's something about it. I, I love all vegetation. Um, I don't want to play favorites, but, you know, there is something transcend, transcendent about it. There's something divine and ethereal, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's going to be delved into um, over the coming weeks. And um, I, uh, I have to say that, though, it's got a special place in my heart. It's probably my favorite. I don't want to pick favorites. but um, And a last quote for you. Um, and then I'm done. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.